Okay, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you to study a little and learn a little bit more through the prophet Isaiah, help us to realize that uh, you have given us this gift of faith and help us to cherish this gift of faith and that you take this faith very, very seriously. In the midst of the many distractions of the world around us, help us to always remain faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, two weeks ago, I know some of you are sitting there, if you're like me, I'm going, what did I even have for breakfast this morning? Okay, two weeks ago, uh, we were in the section, can I readjust this, okay, there we go, of um, talking about the day of wrath, and uh, that day of wrath, that day of destruction, uh, that end time, so to speak, when God separates out those that believe versus those that don't believe. Uh, and it's not going to be a good day. Okay? And Isaiah has been given a picture of this. And so we're going to continue on with chapter 24. And we made it up to verse 16, so we're going to start picking up at verse 17. And within that picture... Isaiah is given uh, this terror and the pit are the snare upon you, O inhabitants of the earth. He who flees at the sound of the terror shall fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows of heaven are open, and the foundations of the earth tremble. Now, two weeks ago, we were also talking about why Isaiah was lamenting a little bit. He, he was a little bit sad. Why? Because he could see the type of destruction that was going on. And here you get a little bit of the reason why he was sad. Because there is no escape. So if you do not believe and trust in Jesus Christ, is there another way of getting into heaven? Now a lot of people will ask that as a question. Because they think, uh, you know, Jesus might be one of many ways. But scripture very clearly says there's only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. And so in verse 18, you have that illustration, you know, he who flees at the sound of terror is going to fall into the pit. And he who climbs out of the pit is going to be what? Is going to be caught into the snare. Bottom line is, there is no escape. You cannot escape the last day. All people will be gathered. And all people will then be separated to, from those that believe and trust in God and those that do not. There isn't a back door, so to speak. There isn't a great exception. Now, sometimes people will start arguing and saying, yes, but, because we always like exceptions in today's world, we, we don't necessarily always like no choice and no win scenarios. So they'll sit there and say, well, does the scriptures give us everything we need to know about God? And the answer to that, you know, to be fair, is no. But scripture does give us enough to show us our Savior, shows us what we should be believing, what we should be teaching, how we should be living, and shows us this beautiful path and this is what God wants us to know. And so their argument then continues. Well, there could be an unknown means of grace. Well, I can't argue that one because I do not know the complete exhaustive concordance of God's mind, so to speak. I'm not God. So could God in the back of his mind have an unknown means of grace? Well, the answer is could be yes. But in what God has given to us is no, there isn't. And I want to take God at his word. So I don't want to sit there and say, well, God said A on Monday, but on Tuesday, he's now going to change that A to also be an A and a B. So I'm going to say God's word is consistent. It's in relationship with one another, and his word is not going to change. So if God says, there is going to be no escape, there is no escape. 
So when other people like to try to entertain these ideas of saying, there's got to be some unknown means of grace. A, scripture doesn't talk about it. That's why it's unknown. And B, you're now battling against the consistency of God's word, which puts you in a very dangerous position. Take the easy path. Just believe and trust in God. Plain and simple. We'll make it really super easy. All you have to do is just continue to put your faith and trust in God alone. Any questions about that? Because that might have been a little bit of a new concept. Yeah, John? I think uh, what we're talking about is the back door. People get, trying to get up in heaven. Well, God would send them to that planet called 666. <laughs> So John's comment is, yeah, if they're looking for that back door to get into heaven, um, there, there is a back door, so to speak, but it's not necessarily going to heaven. It's heading to hell, kind of be, be like. And I think that's, you know, it's fair enough that's consistent here with what God has in mind. Those that believe. And also think of it from God's point of view. You are going to be in perfect relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, okay? He's redeemed you as his people. So if you don't want Jesus, why are you wanting to spend the rest of eternity with Jesus? So, you know, using these arguments, there is no back door into hell, uh, into heaven here. Okay, so, but now there's another part to all of this uh, with verse 18. For the windows of heaven are open. And if you notice at the bottom of the screen, I have uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse uh, 11. At the time of the flood, in the 600th year of Noah's life, yes, they lived a lot longer than they do now. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the day all the foundations of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were open. And then, you know, now comes the rain and tons of rain, okay? So again, when uh, we're talking about no one can escape from the pit, uh, if they do, they go into a snare. Um, and now we're talking about the windows of heaven. You get that imagery of there is no choice. There is no escape. Just like in the flood, everyone died except for eight people. Noah and his wife his three sons and their wives. Eight. That is it. No one else escaped. Now you're thinking, wow, all this bad news, and it's the holiday time. It's coming up. Uh, we're in the season of Advent, but don't worry. Uh, we'll be trying to get through this to get to some of the good news that comes later. Uh, verse 19. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is split apart. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It sways like a hut. Its transgressions lie heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. This is the reason why Isaiah is grieving. You know, he's given this picture here, and everything he knows is going to be shattered. Everything he knows is going to be destroyed. And yes, there's going to be a little bit of grief. But behind that grief, verse 21, On that day the Lord will punish the Lord of hosts in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in prison. And after many days they will be punished. I'm going to hold off on the host of heaven for a moment. But notice that uh, there is going to be a punishment even for the, the kings, for the leaders, for the leaders who should have known better and should have followed God and did not. The whole um, uh, leading up to the whole exile gives you leader after king after king of Israel who, again, should have known better but did not. And they're going to be thrown into the pit. They're going to be shut up into prison. Now let's back up to... The Lord will punish the host of heaven. So what is that host of heaven? Those are the ones that are praising God. Aren't they? Fallen okay. Angels. Huh? Fallen angels. Okay. 
Uh, so the first comment I heard was heavenly beings, okay, uh, praising God in heaven, but uh, they're going to be punished though. So the answer to it is to remember, as uh, Don said, uh, God created angels. Some of them disobeyed. Some of them uh, fell away. We're thinking of Satan, Lucifer, uh, the devil, however you want to describe him. And so this beautiful picture of the Lord will punish the Lord, uh, the host of heaven. Let me give you the Revelation version of that from Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the, a great chain. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive uh, the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So let's back up to uh, Isaiah here from that 21. That has given you that picture of that day of wrath when Satan will be bound. And not just Satan, but the whole host of heaven that had fallen away. John, question? What does a thousand years mean in this particular group? Oh, I'm going to dodge that question because we're talking about Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah doesn't use a thousand years. When we were going through the Bible study on Revelation, uh, we realized that a thousand years is a very symbolic number. Okay? Uh, so... Um, you know, uh, that whole concept of no escape that Isaiah uh, was naming uh, in the previous slide, uh, we also realize that once you're in this place, it's not like a purgatory where you can work yourself out. It is truly eternal. So the devil and his uh, legions or how many uh, angels that he has within his hosts that are following him besides the rest of the humans, you're not going to see them slowly pop back into heaven after a period of time, in case if that's what you're referring to. And no, the answer is no, this is, he, they are completely bound and put away. Remember, they didn't want to be with Christ. They didn't want to follow Christ's directives. So they rebelled. We likewise have also rebelled, but in the midst of our rebellion, we do what? We repent. We confess our sins. We, we say to God, you're right, God, I made a mistake. I'd rather be with you. The people who are bound, who are in hell, are not saying that. They are still in their state of uh, rebellion. So let's go to verse uh, 23. Then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Sinai and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Okay, so how does the, the moon get confounded and the sun ashamed? Well, think about the glory of God. And that's why I put in that Revelation chapter 22 verse 5 passage. Giving you again St. John's revelation of that picture of heaven. And night will be no more. They will have no need of light. No, I'm sorry, they have no need. They will need no light or of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. So the glory of the Lord will outshine the moon and outshine the sun. So if you think about, you know, going outside and being in the sun and how bright that sun is and how it illuminates it, the glory of the Lord outdoes that. You also may remember when Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and went to a mountaintop and there he was transfigured. And for a moment, a few moments, they would see the glory of God. And, you know, the transfiguration account, you know, describes it as Jesus shining brightly. Now, I'm sure it was not the full glory of God, because otherwise they might, you know, it would be really, really bright. But 
It was as much as they could handle, so to speak. So just keep that in mind is that he ends this chapter with, oh, by the way, there is going to be a glorious ending for those that believe. And you have that beautiful connection, um, because Isaiah is going to allude to it, of Mount Zion and Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is there. And keep that in mind, because uh, Isaiah is going to name Zion uh, apart from Jerusalem, and so you just have to keep that in mind when you hear Mount Zion, also think Jerusalem with that. But that is that day of wrath. There will be eternal death for those that don't believe, but eternal life for those that do believe. So now we're going to change the, the two. So we're, we're moving from that day of wrath to what happens to us as believers after the day of wrath. Well, now you're saying, now we're in heaven. Now we have the joys of heaven. And that's exactly where Isaiah is going to take you. So now we're getting to the good news. Okay, Remember I told you I was had to finish up with the day of wrath, but now we're getting to the good news. This is the part that we really, really like, and we want to stay here for a while. Uh, chapter 25, verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. So notice where the, the, song, the song of thanksgiving begins with. It talks about this is God's work. <clears throat> notice the direction is not upon human achievement, but this is upon God. God is the one who's in control. God is the one who planned this out. God is the one who had promises long ago that are finally being fulfilled. And yes, God is seen as being faithful uh, and sure. And that's how this song of thanksgiving begins. Verse 2. For you have made the city a heap, a fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's place is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. Okay, so you, you have the destruction, so to speak, of earth and of all the, the places, so to speak. And so you have uh, that uh, what was... What people had trusted in before, those fortified cities, it's all going to be laid waste. Okay? The foreigner's place, again, re reference to those that didn't believe, uh, will never be rebuilt. Remember, this is after that great and last day. So, now, it's interesting, when you get to strong peoples will glorify you, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, how are they going to glorify God? If they're on the other side, uh, so to speak, uh, how will they glorify God? But you have to remember, as what Scripture says, I forgot to toss it in as a Bible passage, that on the last day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Okay? Um, so the cities of ruthless nations will now fear Him. Will fear God. Why? They're going to be tossed into the pit. Now they will know and it'll be obvious to them, there is one God, God Almighty. John, I think you had a question? Or? I'm thinking, non-believers. How do you punish non-believers when they don't believe what we're talking about? I mean, if you punish sinners, I, I, you categorize them as a sinner. Here, let, 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 me, let me try to refocus, I think, what you were kind of saying here, is when it comes to God's judgment, and this is where I like to use the idea of uh, a family. If you want to be in the family of God for eternity, okay, uh, then you're with the family of God for eternity. But if you are rebellious and you have said no to the family, 
then you're not going to be with God for eternity. But by the way, there's only one other place to be. There isn't a secondary uh, story to heaven where you can just sort of hide out into the basement or so to speak. Uh, no, this is now talking a separate place apart from God. So as we struggle with people, uh, because we're all sinners, okay? Believers and unbelievers, we fall in the same bucket of sinners. The difference is, do we desire to be with Christ? Do we see Christ as our savior from sin or, or not? Do we desire to be in, with Christ in heaven above? And if we have that desire, that desire comes from faith. Because we see a lot of people in today's world who, they're sinners just like us, but they don't have that desire to be with Christ. And as a result, what's going to happen? They will be in eternal death and damnation. Because Christ wants all people to be with him. But he's not going to take you kicking and screaming and you are adamant about saying, I refuse to be there. I have actually have seen this uh, on various occasions where because of, say, a special event here at church, whether it be a baptism or a confirmation, you know, you or a wedding, okay, you have people gathering, and there's a certain family expectation that you will be here at the church at this time and this place, okay, for whatever these special events. And I have seen it within people where they basically, they come to the church, and they have this look like, I'm doing this under compulsion. I really don't want to be here. Every single thing that about their facial expression, their, their, how they are, their mannerism and how they walk is that face of evil that says, you know, don't even talk to me. I don't even want to engage you. I just want to get out of this church building as much as possible. And, you know, my heart goes out to these people. I'm like, you know... We have a, a God who loves you, a God who forgives you, a God who adores you. And you just by their expression, they're not saying anything, they're keeping their mouth shut, they still want to be within their family, so they feel obligated to be there, but you can almost tell the first thing they want to do is get out of that building. Well, they're not going to sit there and say, I want to spend the rest of my life here at Peace Lutheran Church. Well, same thing with heaven. If we're going to be spending the rest of our life with Jesus Christ, we better appreciate and adore him as our Savior. Not sitting there going, I'm only here because my mom or my dad made me be here. So I'm hoping that helps with that little bit of that explanation of giving you some idea that, yeah, there's going to be a judgment. And maybe we should just look at that judgment that basically says, okay, do you want to be with Christ in heaven above? Yes or no? If you've lived your whole life being away from Christ and being opposed to Christ, then the answer is no. But if you live your life in repentance, because we're both sinners, both groups of people, all people are sinners, but repentance that says, I want to be with Christ, I'm sorry for my sins which separate me from God, I don't want to do these, then you got the gift of heaven. They will have an excuse for not knowing that there's punishment. You're right. They won't have an excuse because they will know that's part of that mystery of that gospel message that continues to go out and will go out to all nations because that's actually one of the, um, uh, the lines of thought that some people will use about and use, have as a question, what about those who have not heard? And in Paul's letter to the Romans, he reminds us that the law of God was actually written on our hearts, okay? And, but yet we should take every opportunity to help support our missionaries that go overseas, uh, our missionaries here even in the United States, and even our opportunities to engage people while we're still here on earth to tell people about the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we will leave that into God's hands. Uh, but we also know what God's word has to uh, say. But at the end, 
every, that's where that verse 3 comes in. On that last day, okay, everyone's going to be saying, oh yeah, there is a God. Either you're going to be rejoicing, going, yes, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come, or you're going to go, whoops, there is a God, and um, I think I just blew it. Okay, so let's go on to uh, the next. Uh, I want to back up uh, with Isaiah for a little bit um, because it talks about um, that foreigner's place is a city no more. Well, I'm going to ask you to remember something that's probably now almost a month ago, not just what you had for breakfast, but from Isaiah chapter 21, verse 9. And behold, here comes riders, horsemen in pairs. And he answered, fallen, fallen is Babylon. And that was the, it was a name for a particular land that was uh, enemies of the people of Israel. It's also a name of, um, you could say, uh, of evil that in the book of Revelation is used to describe um, that, that last day and the demise of evil. So fallen, fallen is Babylon and all the carved uh, images of her gods he has shattered to the ground. So Isaiah has already given you an idea of what city we're talking about being destroyed. It's being Babylon, not which is not a city, but is representing of all who are unbelievers. So now let's continue the song of uh, Thanksgiving, verse uh, 25. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place, you subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is put down. So you, you get an idea here that the poor, the needy, God is lifting up, God is protecting. And throughout scripture, God always does have a special place for the poor and needy because those are the people who are typically victimized the most in today's society and also in previous societies. The weak, those are the ones that the quote-unquote powerful prey upon. That is something that is almost like a universal truth throughout our human history. And so God is saying, uh, you have, uh, in, in this part of uh, Isaiah is saying, you have been that stronghold for the poor. You're the one that's been protecting them. You're the one that has been there for them. And then the last part of this, verse 5, um, you also got to remember a little bit of your Old Testament history that uh, Isaiah was also during the time of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah had to deal with um, the Ramshakeh who was going to come and destroy uh, all of Jerusalem. And, you know, they're making all these uh, noises and all these threats and all these promises. And even went so far to say, and your God sent us. Yeah, there's a little bit of truth in that. But uh, in the midst of all that noise and all that puffing, puffing themselves up, Isaiah describes it. You subdue the noise of, of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is put down. Okay. So, you know, it gives you that impression that all their noise, all their trusting in themselves on that last day in part of our victory is, yet you were so happy about yourself, but guess what? There is an almighty God and you didn't believe and trust in him. So now we're going to probably get to probably one of the more famous sections of Isaiah. And I can probably almost guarantee you have heard these words before as we get to what's considered to be the eschatological banquet. Bottom line is that's a fancy word for the heavenly banquet. Okay. So from Isaiah chapter 25 verse 6. 
On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Now the question is, what mountain are we talking about? Again, if you go back to what I was kind of talking about before, about Mount Zion and Jerusalem, okay? You know, Jerusalem being there at Mount Zion, we're, we're kind of talking about Mount Zion. Now, what's happened at Mount Zion, if I could use that as a, a wider space, so to speak? Well, you had Jerusalem, and just outside of Jerusalem, what occurred? Nothing. Yeah, the crucifixion, okay. Uh, okay. You also had Bethany there, you're right, Bethany was just outside, you had the, uh, a few other things, but I was kind of looking for the, the crucifixion, because when is, for this particular place, the crucifixion is that particular point where our sins are forgiven, where our salvation is given to us, and now here is the heavenly banquet. And so now it's going to give you that picture of that heavenly banquet, and it's going to say, on this mountain, on this place where, you know, Christ, you know, died on the cross to, to give you uh, eternal life, now we're going to subscribe to you eternal life. So is it going to be exactly on Mount Zion? Probably not. Uh, this heavenly banquet is truly going to be in heaven wherever that's going to be, the new heavens and the new earth. John, did you have a question? Is that the end of the story or the beginning of the story? The answer is yes. <laughs> I like what the hymn um, Amazing Grace does with it. Uh, and I can't remember the exact words, but there's a phrase in there. It says, uh, you know, like uh, after uh, th uh, 10,000 years or something uh, that, you know, we've been here in heaven above, you know, and it just sort of gives you that timeless part of eternity here is what is a, a 10,000 years that's going to be seeming almost just like a day. And that's actually part of uh, the sermon for Sunday. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. We don't necessarily understand that because we're still here on earth, but in heaven, then, yeah, we'll, we'll understand it. A thousand years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years for the rest of eternity. It doesn't matter. It's all like a day. Okay. We, we don't have that concept yet of time, but we will. We will. Uh, so, you know, is this the beginning of the story, the end of the story? And I can say, yeah, to both, because especially as Isaiah brings it to us, you, you're constantly giving these uh, repeated uh, themes of uh, rebellion, exile, restoration, uh, eternity, and then we're going to go into another cycle of it. So it is um, beginning, the end, the middle, yeah, it's just the whole story. But uh, So take a look at this heavenly banquet here, because we're not talking about cheap food. We're talking the best of food. Okay, And the other aspect about this banquet there's a beautiful teaching point in here that I, I don't want to let go of, is you're eating, you're drinking. Very often, sometimes people sit there and think, oh yeah, when we get to heaven, you know, I'll be this spirit sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. But if you're a spirit, how are you really going to be playing a harp? If you have no body to it, how are you really going to be plucking those strings? Okay, a spirit typically has no body. Okay, and the reason I want to bring this up is we're talking about bodily eating and drinking. Oh, and by the way, if you remember what happened to Jesus after Calvary's cross on three days later, he rose from the dead. Did he rise just in a spirit? And the answer is no, he rose with his body. Likewise, did he eat and drink with his disciples after his resurrection? Again, the answer is yes. So why wouldn't we, when we are with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in a resurrected, glorified body like his, also not be eating and drinking? 
hey, we get to enjoy food, and probably the best thing of all, there's going to be no doctor to tell you, you shouldn't eat that or drink that. Ooh, hey, this is getting better and better. And, and don't we realize while we're here on earth, and especially right now, as we were talking right before we began our, our Bible study, you know, about we're in that holiday period of time where people naturally want to get together, but we are a little concerned because of COVID and stuff like this. But we, we have that natural sense of gathering for big family meals and enjoying one another's company. Well, welcome to the picture of heaven. This isn't like you're going to be in your own isolated room. You're going to be with the family of God. And what do families do? We eat and we drink. Likewise, when God is going to give you a little bit of a picture of what heaven is like, of that eating and drinking and communing with God, he points us to the Lord's Supper. And if you think about it, Christ's body and blood given and shed for you, you know, when we were able to gather around the altar as a table with a special table fellowship, it brings about all these illustrations of God joining us for dinner and we're gathering around the table like the Last Supper event and we are enjoying one another's company with good food. And that is that beautiful intersection point for us while we're here on earth to get a taste of heaven. Now, I have to be careful with that illustration just because you might be saying, Pastor, that little bit of bread that you want to call wafer, I kind of question whether it's real bread. I mean, it's not really tasty. The wine's not too bad, but the bread is not really tasty. And fair enough. And we probably don't give you enough wine that you probably would really want to enjoy for like a dinner time. But again, this is just a little bit of a glimpse of what is yet to come. And here, Isaiah gives you a little bit more of that glimpse. Rich food, well-aged wine, uh, the best of the best. Okay, now a little bit more about this. Verse 7. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Remember I said the mountain was re referenced to Mount Zion? And then you got to kind of remember Calvary's cross at that same place. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he defeats sin, death, and the devil. Isaiah names this. So should it really have been a surprise to the religious leaders during the time of Jesus about what the Messiah was really going to be doing for them? They had these words of Isaiah, but yet they did not want to realize it. They purposely, in the back of their mind, were saying no. Well, okay, then, you know, they, they know this better than I know this. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. We're, we're talking about the Messiah. And all this is going to take place on Mount Zion? And then usher in this great banquet, a uh, heavenly banquet, where there will be no more tears? And God reaffirms it with the phrase, for the Lord has spoken. Wow, continue to speak more and more, please. This is the picture we want to continue to hear. But... Isaiah is going to go on to a little bit of uh, other things. He's going to go into a second Thanksgiving song. And so we're going to talk about that. It uh, begins with verse uh, 9. 
So there's a little bit of a break, a little bit of a different uh, direction. Uh, verse 9. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Notice this is our response, so to speak. That's kind of why it's a little bit of the second song here. And notice what one of the key themes is. We have waited. We don't like to wait. We get impatient, especially in today's world where so many things come to us instantly. You know, if you think back in the day, and I don't want to say in the day because it still happens today, where farmers, you know, you take the seed, or you have a garden, you put the seed into the ground, and you don't come back to that seed the next day and harvest your fruit, do you? No, I know already you're probably almost wishing that would happen, right? It takes months. It takes months and a lot of nurture and care, the sunlight, the water, uh, the care of the, the plant. It takes months for this. But yet, how often do we want to wait? In today's world where we're so used to food being just a hop in the car, or you don't even have to hop in the car now. We have got Uber Eats we can bring in Grubhub. We got food that'll come to you. You just have to dial it up on an app, call it in, and it gets delivered. We don't like to wait. But notice, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. And so this is the Lord. We have waited for him. And for us as Christians, this is our message that we need to hear. We're in this time of Advent, which again is again looking forward to Christ's second coming as we prepare to celebrate his first coming. But what we have to do, we have to wait. Christ will come in his time, in his place and no one knows when that is. I have to be careful because you will hear a lot of these themes picked up on this weekend's message. But uh, so I don't go into another sermon. Uh, let's go on to verse 10. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain and Moab will be trampled down in his place as straw is trampled down in a, a dunghill. Okay, so you have two parts to this. One is that the Lord will rest on this mountain. And I want you to think of like that Sabbath rest. Uh, I want you to think of days of creation. And on, after it was all done, what did the Lord do? He rested. But what about those who didn't believe? There was actually a, a phrase, and it does come from Isaiah. I just can't remember it off the top of my head, sorry. The exact location but I like to use this phrase uh, there is no rest for the wicked okay well guess what you're gonna get a little bit of a glimpse of that Moab typically described as attributed to one of Israel's men, uh, enemies here will be shall be trampled down in his place as straw is trampled down in a dung hill and I want you to hang on to that illustration unfortunately for a moment because you might be going, Pastor, out of all the illustrations, that's not one I really want to continue to hang on to, so to speak. I want to get far away from it. Okay? But so just picture that straw, that dunghill. It's just not good. Because the next verse is going to give you a little bit more of a graphic illustration. Referring to Moab, verse 11 and he will spread out his hands in the midst of it as a swimmer spreads out his hands out to swim. I want to stop in that. So <laughs> Moab is like swimming in this dunghill. Remember, there is no rest for the wicked. So while we're in heaven enjoying the heavenly banquet, being with Christ, What's one of the illustrations used for those in hell? Well, we usually think of hell as that place of burning, okay? And fair enough, that is one of those illustrations. 
But Isaiah also gives you a different illustration, like you're swimming in the midst of a dunghill. Yuck. <laughs> but the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hand. So basically ascribing to uh, the people of Moab their pompous pride. Um, guess what? what brought you there? You did not want to trust in God. You want to trust in yourself instead of God or whatever fake God it is. Well, I hope you're a good swimmer. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just reading this to you. I'm just reading this to you. Okay, uh, verse 12. And the high fortifications of his wall he will bring down, lay low, and cast to the ground to the dust. So everything that Moab was trusting in, you know, the big wall, the big fortifications, no one can touch us. We're the, the mighty people. We're in charge of this earth. You know, all of that is just going to be laid down. It's not going to be there. Nothing is going to give you any support while you're swimming. Okay. So that was that second Thanksgiving song. I know, what to be thankful for? Thankful that I'm not swimming, but I'm in with the Lord in heaven above. Oh, okay, so third Thanksgiving song. I'm not making this up, I didn't write this, okay. Um, let me pick up again that uh, where we just ended with verse 12 of chapter 25. And the high fortifications of his wall he will bring down, lay low, cast to the ground in the dust, Verse 1, in that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. Okay, so those who were swimming were singing, or were like, yep, our fortifications are gone. But the ones that are not swimming, we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Okay, that strong fortress, like that hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. Okay, so there's a beautiful comparison in cra uh, uh, comparison here, and to contrast these two places. One, there is no more wall, and you're swimming, and the other is there is a wall. Let's give praise and thanks to God. Verse two, open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter. Notice what's going on here. You, you can almost get the picture here of the heaven gates being opened here. You know, the pearly gates, so to speak. Uh, open the gates that the righteous, those that keep, that keeps faith, may enter. Again, what's the difference between, going back to John's uh, first question earlier on, what's the difference between us and them? We're both sinners. We both have rebelled against God. The answer is one keeps faith. One wants to be with Christ in heaven above, whereas the other one doesn't. Now we're going to talk a little bit about this faith. Verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So who's the one that keeps us? God is. God is keeping us in this faith. Now, going back to that illustration of that question that John was bringing up, uh, you know, we're both sinners, okay? We believe, but we're still sinners. And that sinner part is still wanting to reject God. And we struggle with that. So if it was up to us, we could not do it ourselves. We need a God who's going to keep us in this faith. A God who gives us this faith and a God who keeps us in this faith. Because if it was up to us, our sinful nature would have hold of us and we would be in the other camp. We would be swimming. But thanks be to God, we have a God who not only rescues us from sin, death, and the devil, but then continues to keep us 
Because if he did not continue to keep us, we would fall away. Keep that in mind as I'm going to go through Luther's explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I only have the first half of it. What does this mean? Luther explains, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. Notice that, kept me. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Notice who's doing the work here. God is doing the work. God is doing the work from saving us, Jesus Christ, on the death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and then Jesus sends us the Holy Spirit so that we have this faith and continues to keep us in this faith. Recently, I think I mentioned in a message that, you know, no one walks through these doors at Peace Lutheran Church without the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Unless, of course, you're one of those people who are compelled by family reasons, as we were talking about before, and you just want to sit there and say, I want to get out of here like you would believe, okay? And unfortunately, that does really happen, okay? So as we realize that when we come here willingly, it's not because we have been enlightened, per se, by self-enlightenment, no. We come here because the Holy Spirit is pulling us. The Holy Spirit is calling us. The Holy Spirit is keeping us in the one true faith. Thanks be to God. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be lost. That's why as we were talking about the stained glass that we have uh, around us here uh, in the sanctuary, I like to say all of it points to Jesus, including that last one in the corner which you have as a picture of the Holy Spirit, the dove, uh, the flame of Pentecost. And you might be thinking, isn't that talking about the Holy Spirit and not talking about Jesus? And the answer is, the Holy Spirit's job is to do what? To constantly point you to Jesus and to bring you to Jesus and to Jesus you, so to speak, if I could use that as a phrase. So that's why the psalmist then says, and we'll end here at verse 4, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. And it's that beautiful summary that sits there and says, this is our trust. Remember, Isaiah is talking to a people who are going to be about ready to be thrown into exile because of their unbelief. And he's giving them this beautiful picture <laughs> Uh, this is what heaven is. Believe, trust in Jesus. This is your life. This is your salvation. And yet, some would, but most didn't. That was the struggle during the time of Isaiah. And I hate to say it. It's actually kind of our struggle even now in today's world is how many times have we tell people about the beautiful message of Christ being born in a manger in Bethlehem, and they shrug it off and go, bah humbug. I could use another Christmas illustration there. But uh, let's close here at this point with uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.